Hello, everyone. On behalf of the organizing team, the Polish U.S. Fulbright Commission, U.S. Embassy in Warsaw, and U.S. Consulate in Krakow, welcome to the first ever Education USA Poland Virtual Fair. My name is Justyna Kozera-Bober, and with my colleagues, Aleksandra Szaniawska, Beata Milewska, and Maria Brzostek, we will be your hosts during this exciting event. With us today are also Amy Steinman, Public Affairs Officer at the U.S. Consulate General in Krakow, Dan Hastings, Cultural Attaché at the U.S. Embassy in Warsaw, and Patrick Slavinsky, U.S. Consul General in Krakow. Thank you to all the students, parents, teachers, and of course, U.S. school representatives for being here today. Education USA is a U.S. Department of State network of over 430 international student advising centers in more than 180 countries, including Poland. Education USA Poland promotes U.S. higher education by offering unbiased and comprehensive information on U.S. schools and connecting them to Polish students. And we hope today's virtual fair will do just that. During the next four hours, you're going to learn firsthand about the incredible diversity of undergraduate programs offered by the participating institutions. You'll get to know their current admissions criteria, also in light of COVID-related disruptions, and the financial aid they provide to international students, which historically has been quite generous. You also have a unique chance to chat with the admissions officers and ask your own questions. Let's now hear from our special guest, Bix Aliu, Chargé de Paix at the U.S. Mission in Poland. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Bix Aliu. I'm the Chargé d'Affaires at the U.S. Mission here in Poland. Welcome. I'm really excited to talk to you today about study in the United States. It's a privilege. Thank you to you and your parents for watching us virtually. We're very excited that we're able to uh, organize this virtual college fair, and we're really excited that you're at the right place at the right time to start thinking strategically about your future. And we hope that the United States will play a big part. You know, we know you have a lot of choices, both here and in Europe, but I have to say that American universities and study in the U.S., it, they're unrivaled. Um, just think about it. Google, Facebook, Netflix, Hulu, um, Moderna, Pfizer. Uh, these are all institutions that are uh, in the United States, pioneering institutions, and there's a reason that they're there. They're there because the United States pioneers with the future, and it makes people successful, and it offers a future of possibilities. You know, I could spend hours citing reasons why you should study in the United States. The sheer volume, uh, the sheer number of colleges and universities that we have, the number of, of different types of specialties and, and um, topics that you can study. But there's one thing that's more important, the experience. The experience of studying in the United States is something that's unparalleled with any other. We have the top ranked universities. We have uh, literally thousands upon thousands of different things you can study. But the most important thing is when uh, somebody studies in the United States, they learn to think outside of the box of how they can apply that education, how they can make a difference in the world, how they can shape the world. And that's why I hope that you will seriously consider study in the U.S. And to help you, we have different institutions, including the Fulbright Commission and also our consulate in uh, Krakow and our uh, embassy here in, in uh, Warsaw has a wealth of information and they can answer your questions. But most importantly, today you have 21 universities universities that are at your whim to, to be able to, to answer all your questions and the experts of these institutions will help you understand why they could be a, bet, a, a good fit for you. So I'm really hoping that you'll learn this, you'll seize this opportunity to be able to talk to these institutions. Your parents can ask questions. Please do feel free to ask anything that you want to, you want to know about the climate, um, what the people are like, what the institution is like, what is the history of the institution? Do they have the backgrounds that you want to study? Do they, you know, what are the sports like? What are the intramural sports like? Please, it's very, very important. In short, I just want to reiterate. You know, it's it, the, the unique way in which American universities help students think about the world, and it, it's truly liberating, magical, and transformational. Now, um, 
I remember the university experience. It made me who I am. And I'm sure that the experience will shape you too. So ask your questions. Find a great place to study in the United States. There's 21 experts here today to be able to help you. My staff and my team are here to help you as well. And we do hope that you choose the United States of America to help shape your future. And uh, we look forward to hearing from you. Good luck, enjoy, and um, we hope you study in the United States. Thank you. I hope these words will inspire you to apply to US schools as much as they inspire Education USA advisors to guide you through this um, educational journey. Before we jump into the first panel, a few technical remarks. Please be aware that this event is being recorded and will be shared in public domains afterwards. There are going to be four separate panels today, each with different school representatives and each with a separate theme. While the first session will focus on the diversity of U.S. higher education, later in the day we'll also talk about liberal arts education, STEM-oriented and honor programs. Each panel will consist of two parts presentations by university representatives and a joint um, Q&A session. While your microphones will remain muted, please take advantage of the chat box where you can type in your questions in English throughout the event. The admissions officers and Education USA advisors will answer those questions as they come. Now, without further ado, let me give a warm welcome to our first panelists. Monica Asser, the Director of International Enrollment Initiatives at Fordham University. Lucy Samo, the Director of International Recruitment at the University of Maine. Um, Tom Bitterman, the Associate Director of Admissions at Suffolk University. Shannon um, Beddo, the Director of International and Veteran Student Services at Houston Baptist University. And Chris Dixon, the Senior Assistant Director of um, International Admissions at Wabash College. This panel will focus on the diversity of U.S. higher education. In fact, as you can already tell, the participating institutions perfectly reflect this diverse landscape. The panel includes small and big schools located all across the U.S., um, private institutions as well as a public university, uh, research and liberal arts institutions, um, and immense only college as well as religious universities. All of the schools offer a wide variety of programs and they value and actively recruit diverse student populations, not only from the US, but from around the world. Let's move on to the presentations and learn more about these schools from their admissions officers. Let's start at the beautiful East Coast of the States. Monica, the virtual stage is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, this is such an honor to be part of this inaugural uh, presentation. And I'm going to share my screen in one second, I think. There we go. Great. Uh, OK. So yes, I'm Monica Esser. I'm representing Fordham University, which is the Jesuit University of New York. Fordham is considered really a middle-sized university in the United States. We have about 16,000 students overall. Uh, as you'll hear, university size really ranges quite a bit in the US. Uh, we're considered a middle-sized university, but we have very small classes at Fordham. So students are not in sitting in large lectures of two or 300 students at all. Uh, the average class size is just 22 students and the faculty to student ratio is 1 to 13. So students have a lot of interaction with directly with our tenured faculty and the opportunity to really engage directly with our faculty. Students are really in the driver's seat uh, in, at a Fordham, in a Fordham education, uh, both in terms of, you know, these small classes where there's a lot of discussion where they can really be part of deciding what is discussed in a, in a, on a given day. Um, as well as in terms of uh, the, cho the choice of classes, the choice of major and the choice of classes that they take. So there's some structure in our core curriculum, but students have a lot of choices in you know, what their major will be, what they might minor in, what classes they actually select in a given semester. So it's a little bit different than most European systems of, edu of higher education in that way. 
and students, I think, really take advantage of the kind of personalized opportunities that they have. The university offers majors in arts, social science, natural science, language, humanities, communication, and business. So it's really quite a, quite a broad array of academic subjects that you can choose from at Fordham. And you would study one of these majors uh, on one of our two campuses. We have a campus right in the heart of Manhattan in New York City. If you drop a pin in the middle of the island of Manhattan, that's where our Lincoln Center campus is located. It's just a block from Central Park and Columbus Circle subway stop. It's right next to Lincoln Center for the Performing Arts. So it's a really fantastic location where we have a couple thousand undergraduate students. And our other campus is the beautiful Rose Hill campus in the Bronx. It's about 5,000 undergraduate students studying there. And it's very green and park-like with ivy covered stone buildings. It really has the feel of almost a suburban college campus, uh, but it's located right in the city with access, subway access to everywhere in the city. And Fordham is considered a major research institution in the United States, which means that we have lots of research opportunities for our students on campus with our faculty. Uh, we also work with uh, different organizations outside of the campus so that students can get research opportunities outside of the campus. Uh, we have opportunities for students to do internships in New York City, which is just a phenomenal place uh, for practical experiences. Students in our business program can intern on Wall Street. Students interested in international studies can work with United Nations NGOs. Uh, we have students that are really involved in community service. We, our students did over a million hours of community service last year. And so our students really get a lot of practical experiences that they're balancing with their academic program. Uh, as you can see, we guarantee housing on our campus campuses for all four years. And uh, we will talk a little bit about the application process to the university. You can see here we use the common application at Fordham. Uh, as most of the universities here, we will require transcripts from your secondary education. We require at least one letter of recommendation, uh, English language proficiency exam results, and at Fordham we accept the TOEFL, IELTS, and the Duolingo DET. And students at Fordham, international students have the uh, kind of two options as they're applying. They're either applying for uh, our need-based financial aid program or they're not. Uh, in what, either way, you kind of fill out a form to tell us which, which program you're picking. As you can see here, we do have merit scholarships that students do not need to apply for. They would automatically be in consideration for our merit scholarships that range up to about $20,000 per year. But these awards are competitive. They're offered usually to the top 10 to 15% of our applicant pool. We offer a need-based financial aid program that offers aid up to the cost of tuition, does require the CSS profile, as the financial aid application, which is due at the same time as your academic application. And this program is highly selective. So about 7% of the students who applied last year qualified for one of our need-based aid awards. We also do have athletic scholarships. We are an NCAA Division I school. Uh, those scholarships are really um, determined by our athletic coaches and you know, students are not really working with the admissions office uh, for those scholarships. So that's kind of a brief overview. Uh, we were asked to speak on this panel a little bit about diversity and uh, as I mentioned the diversity of academic programs at a school like Fordham is very rich. You can choose from over 70 different majors. You can double major if you want. Uh, you can major in one area and minor in another. Um, working with a Polish student right now who was admit admitted to our business school who wants to do a Spanish minor, totally fine. Um, we're happy when students have multiple interests that they want to pursue. And that, you know, the program really allows you to, to study multiple areas uh, in an ongoing way. Um, we are located, as I said, right in the heart of New York City. So our campuses really reflect the diversity of New York City. And New York City is one of the most diverse and tolerant cities in the world. Uh, it's really kind of an incredible place to study. You can hear hundreds of languages as you walk around on the streets of New York. Uh, the Fordham campus has students that 35% uh, of our students are, are students of color. Uh, students are coming from almost all 50 states uh, and about 80 different countries internationally in the undergraduate program. So there's lots of different diversity. Um, as I mentioned, Fordham is the Jesuit University of New York, which means that we are founded by the Jesuits, an order of Catholic priests that have about a 500 year tradition of kind of starting academic programs throughout the world. And, uh, but that doesn't mean that we are exclusively a uh, Jesuit a Catholic school. Students come to the university from all sorts of different religious backgrounds. 
So uh, we really are, you know, as, as, as was mentioned in, in the introduction, looking to bring students to campus from a variety of different backgrounds, faiths, socioeconomic situations, geographic diversity. Um, and the last comment that I will make before I pass the baton to our, the next school is that Fordham is part of the Jesuit school of global, uh, Jesuit network of global schools. So there are almost 200 Jesuit universities worldwide. There are 27 in the US. Becoming a student at Fordham is really becoming a part of that Jesuit network, which is just inherently a global network. So, you know, we, we feel the institution really offers students lots of diversity in all sorts of different ways. Uh, and I think my time is about up. So uh, thank you very much for joining us today. And I hope this is a really helpful uh, experience for you. Thank you, Monica. Uh, we're going to stay at the East Coast. Let's hear from Lucy. Okay, hello everyone. Good morning. Um, we wish that we could be with you in Poland, um, but that will be for another post-pandemic time. Um, I am going to share my screen. Um, yeah, can you see my screen? Yes. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so, um, so good morning. My name is Lucy Sommel and um, I am from the University of Maine, uh, which is a public university um, that's located in the northeast of the U.S. Um, we are about a one hour flight to um, New York City. Um, and about a four hour drive to Boston, so we're up in the corner. Um, we are, our university is located in a really safe part of the US um, and we um, always share that information. Parents ask us that a lot, so we include it on our presentations. Um, students are not always as interested, but we like to, to get that information out there because we know that that's a question that, um, that uh, international students and parents have. Um, we are a, um, a top 100 public college and university and we have students from about 75 different countries um, and with a total student body of about 11,000 students. Um, so about 9,000 undergrad and about 2,000 graduate students. Uh, I'm going to highlight a couple of the programs um, that are um, particularly popular at UMaine, and then I'll go into some more of our, um, as we're talking about the, the diversity of options available in the US, I'll talk about a few of our more unique programs. Um, so we have a big college of engineering, um, which focuses a lot on uh, renewable energy and um, um, uh, we do a lot with offshore wind and composite materials, um, as well as a lot in um, bioengineering. Um, we also have a, um, a large business school um, that is AACSB accredited. So that's a good um, uh, marker of quality for business schools as you're looking at different universities. Um, we have a Bloomberg lab where students can um, work in real time with what, with, um, what traders are using. Um, and then we also have a student investment fund that is, um, has grown significantly over the years. It's a, it's a fund that's run entirely by students. Um, and so they decide what stocks to buy and what stocks to sell. Um, and so it's a great opportunity to get uh, firsthand, you, you know, real world experience while, while you're a student. Um, so a lot of different opportunities within our business school um, to, uh, to prepare for, for future jobs and internships. Um, and then I wanted to go through a couple of our more unique programs to show you that um, you'll find as you look at different universities in the US, there are lots of colleges of engineering, lots of schools of business, but um, we, I love to talk to students who are interested in programs that are, are a, little, um, a little bit less popular, a little bit more unique. So um, we do a lot of work in, um, uh, marine science and we do a lot in climate change. Many of our Polish students actually come to us through our Climate Change Institute. Um, so there are a lot of opportunities for research there. Um, the, climate change student, the Climate Change Institute is working around the globe and, um, and so it's a very, um, 
diverse group of um, students and faculty within that program. Um, and then some other, some other unique ones like uh, wildlife ecology and zoology. Um, so I encourage you, one of the nice things about university in the US is, um, is just the multitude of majors that you can choose from. So I think, um, and, and the ability to major and minor. Um, so to maybe do, if your parents really want you to do business, as we often find with some, with some of our international students, um, you can do a business program and then simultaneously, maybe you have a really um, a serious interest in theater. And so you can double major in theater or minor in theater. So you can kind of um, cover a lot of different interests that you may have. Um, our university uses the Common App and we also have our own application. Um, like many of the universities you'll hear from today, we have a variety of ways that students can um, show their English proficiency. So the common ones are TOEFL, IELTS, and Duolingo, um, but students also can um, show their English proficiency through um, their SAT score, through um, studying at an English language um, uh, high school or university. So there are a couple of different ways and we're always happy to work with students on that. Um, and then we don't, uh, we don't require the SAT or the ACT. Um, so that's optional and sometimes students will submit it because they've done well and they want that to be included in their application, um, but, that's, um, but that's not required. Um, we offer merit scholarships to students um, from five to $15,000 per year. And, um, um, and those scholarships are um, awarded at the time of application. So at the same time that students um, complete their application for admission, they're considered for scholarships. Um, there's no additional application that's required. Um, and then I know this is primarily um, undergrad focused here, but um, I do want to share that at UMaine, like at other universities, at the grad level, there are very good opportunities for funding. So I always encourage students to investigate if they are interested in a graduate, a master's degree, to investigate what types of funding are available. Um, at UMaine, for example, uh, a lot of our um, cover a mission and also pay a living stipend. So I just encourage you to kind of keep your um, um, keep your mind open to that possibility. Um, and then just quickly in the, in the, in the few seconds that I have left, um, um, uh, as we, we, we said, we're talking about the diversity of opportunities available in the U.S., the diversity of institutions. Um, and so uh, we, um, we want to have as diverse a population, student population as possible, um, come from, from both from countries and languages and backgrounds. Um, so, um, so we travel the globe to talk to students when it's, when it's not a pandemic. Um, we work with state department programs like Fulbright um, to encourage students to join us through that avenue. Um, we are a Division I school as well, so a lot of um, our sports teams have, um, have many international students. I, I encourage anyone who is a strong athlete to consider that option for, for, um, for finding a pathway to, to the U.S. Um, and, um, and then we do abroad and visiting students. So that's another way to, um, some students don't want to come for their entire degree. They just want to come for a portion of their degree, and that's always a possibility as well. Um, I think I'm out of time, so I'll just leave you with my contact info. I'm always happy to um, answer questions or chat about opportunities in the U.S. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Lucy. You're right on time. Um, Tom, please tell us about <laughs> Suffolk. Yes, thank you. I will do that. Um, I'm going to share my screen as soon as I can here. Okay, we're good, right? Yes, we can see the presentation. Thank you, very good. Yes, the next time we meet, I hope it could be in Poland. I have some very good memories of my trips to Warsaw and Gdansk and uh, down to Krakow. So hopefully it will be a, a future time that we can actually see each other in person. But for today, this is the best we can do. My name is Tom Biederman. I am an Associate Director of Admission for Suffolk University. Our main campus is in Boston in the United States, and I'm actually based in our branch campus in Madrid, Spain. That's the background you can see behind me.
Um, Boston is a large metro area of about 4.8 million people. It's located in the northeastern part of the country. Um, you've, you've heard from Maine, which is up here on the, on the top, and New York City, which is about five hours down to the south of Boston, and the Canadian border is about seven hours away. Um, 250,000 students from around the world um, make Boston their home, so it really is a city that breeds academia. Suffolk is what we call an urban campus. Uh, the buildings of the university make up the downtown area. So Boston is literally at your doorstep. Uh, the classrooms, residence halls, administrative offices, library, theater, it's all in the downtown area. You can see some buildings here. This building here is a um, one of our academic and administrative office buildings. This is our law school. We have a residence hall down here. There's another residence hall, brand new, that we just opened last fall. Um, it used to be a Hilton Hotel. Now it's student housing um, back in there. So the buildings of the university are part of the downtown area. Um, we're right around the corner from the State House from Massachusetts, which is down here on that gold dome under the O in the lower left-hand part of the photo. Um, the business district is down the street. The Massachusetts General Hospital, one of the top hospitals in the country, is around the corner. Fortune 500 companies, research institutes, so it's all right there. We offer um, university-sponsored housing. It is guaranteed for two years, um, and um, students have access to that, um, but they may live on their own if they wish. Uh, Boston has a subway system, and all of the subway lines come into where we're at since we're in the center of the city, so students can commute in from wherever they're living. We say we're a mid-sized university. We're probably on the smaller end of that mid-sized. Um, there's about 5,000 undergraduate students. Um, it's not too big, not too small. It might feel like a larger school because you've got 60 plus majors to choose from, division three sports teams, lots of clubs and organizations, but your average class size is gonna be about 22 students. So your day-to-day -day life has the advantages of a smaller, institution, but you still have all of the infrastructure and options of a larger school. As far as academics go, we've got three main divisions of the university, the College of Arts and Sciences, the Sawyer Business School, and the Law School for postgraduate degree study. So you can major in one area and minor in another. I think you're hearing that from all of us here. Um, you can major in, for example, psychology in the College of Arts and Sciences and minor in marketing in the business school or major in big data and business analytics and then minor in social media. So you can make those combinations between the different schools and you're actually admitted to the university as a whole. So you have all of those options available to you. Um, you've got lots of, lots of flexibility and you can even start out as undecided if you're not sure um, and find your path with us. But it's not just what you learn in the classroom. It, we take that theory and put it into practice through experiential learning. Um, our broadcast journalism students are um, producing live segments for cable news network. Our marketing students are you know, doing actual market research and strategy consulting for downtown businesses. So um, that is an essential part of the experience with us. Soft skills are especially important these days. Um, artificial intelligence and machines are taking away a lot of jobs. And so um, you, you need these skills like creativity, collaboration, adaptability, and emotional intelligence. Those are things a robot can't learn. Um, and those are the skills that are gonna help you be successful in your future career. Um, and then our global perspective, um, our international perspective with students from around the world, as well as opportunities to study abroad. Um, Suffolk really is diverse. About 20% of our students are from outside the United States. They're from almost 100 countries around the world. Um, and you can get involved with the different clubs and organizations and get together with other like-minded classmates or make friends with someone whose background is completely different. And you've got these international affinity groups, uh, the Vietnamese Students Club, Russian Speakers, Latinx Association, the Muslim Students Associations. And so it really broadens your view and adds to some dynamic class discussions. We continue to be at the forefront of embracing a diverse student population. At Suffolk, diversity is activated by inclusion, um, creating a welcoming environment where all voices are heard and are able to make meaningful contributions. Here, our differences aren't obstacles to overcome, but assets to be celebrated. Um, our Center for Student Diversity and Inclusion provides individual support, mentoring, referrals, and education to foster a welcoming, 
safe and inclusive environment for all students, especially those students who have been historically marginalized and their allies. We have a Center for International Programs um, and Services that consist of two offices. Um, the International Student Services Office is your main resource for um, immigration matters, um, all of the paperwork that goes along with the visa process, and they schedule programs for like the home away from home to connect international students with um, other students to make them you know, help them with that adaptation process. And the study abroad office helps students when they're going to study away, for example, at our um, partner institutions or at our main at our branch campus here in Madrid, Spain. Um, they can spend a year or two here and then make the internal transfer to Boston um, after they complete their coursework here or um, come as a study abroad student and spend a semester or here in Madrid is the same university. Everything's equivalent. Classes are in English um, and they stay on track with their academic program. As far as scholarships go, all students are admitted are eligible for a merit scholarship, the highest scholarship can cover up to 50% of the tuition fee, and it's part of the application process. You get your scholarship award um, with your admission decision. Um, you can earn advanced placement credit with IB diploma, um, British A levels that saves you time and tuition that way. And between my colleagues and I, we cover the world. Um, I handle applications from Western Europe and countries in Africa, and my colleagues in Boston cover Asia, Middle East, the Americas, um, and we speak Spanish, French, and English, so um, we are multicultural as well. So I think that's it to give you the brief overview about Suffolk. I will pass it on to my next colleague. Thank you, Tom. And now let's venture into Texas. Shannon, the mic is yours. Hello everyone, good afternoon. My name is Shannon Beto and I am the Director of International and Veteran Student Services here at Houston Baptist University. So here's Texas in the United States. We're the second largest state and there's four major cities. And um, Houston is really important. It's a large economic area um, in the United States. We are the energy capital of the world. Um, we have the largest medical center in the world. So if you're interested in health area, um, nursing, we have a wonderful nursing program um, at HBU and we have uh, medical humanities, which is the health administration area. Um, so it's super important, especially in Houston. If you're interested in business, we have lots of international business, accounting, marketing, things like that, because a lot of that happens in Houston. Um, it's the best city to find a job after graduating because everybody comes to Houston for jobs. That's really important in Houston. Um, because of the engineering fields, the manufacturing, everything that happens there. We have the Port of Houston, which brings in lots of goods from all over the world into Houston. So it's a huge place um, for internships and jobs and things like that. And the cost of living is really, really low. Um, and so that's all really um, good for our international students. Okay, so we wanted to talk a little bit about diversity. HBU is one of the most diverse um, universities in the United States. We have lots of different types of um, students um, at HBU. We have students from 40 different countries and um, it's just extremely diverse. You can see it in the students walking around campus. It's just um, really great to see that diversity on campus. The great thing about applying to HBU is that it's free. Um, so if you want to just try applying, then um, it doesn't cost you anything to apply. Um, we are test optional. I know students have been asking about this. Y'all are really worried about that SAT. Um, you don't have to worry about the SAT right now because most schools are test optional. And so what that means is that we're really looking at your grades. So that means that you really need to be studying hard right now um, and getting those high grades. And what, so what we need to do is get that English proficiency still. I'm going to talk about that in just a second, but we need um, a short answer essay question. We need, if you're doing some volunteer work or leadership activities, that really helps your application, makes that strong in some letters of recommendation. Um, also, so English proficiency, a lot of you were asking about this. A lot of schools, we are typical of what a lot of schools are doing. A lot of schools are using dual lingo. Um, and so I would definitely look into that because you can do that online and from your home and it's pretty cheap to do that. 
Um, so a lot of schools weren't using Duolingo before, but now we are, and it's been really helpful during COVID. Um, our tuition and scholarships. So we have up to $23,000 a year in scholarships for our international students. We give the same scholarships to our international students as we do any other student. Um, and so we have a lot of international students come on really big scholarships. Um, so definitely take a look um, at that with HBU and we can set up a one on one Zoom meeting and just talk to you about your situation and what your interests are and help you. Um, I actually have one of my current students um, who's on the call to kind of talk to you about her experience because I thought you would like to hear about um, what a current student's experience is. Natalia, do you want to say a few words? Yeah, absolutely. Hi, hi everyone. Uh, first and foremost, thank you so much for having me on the call. It's so honored. So many people are sound. I was all nervous. Uh, but just just came. Um, I'm actually from Poland, so uh, I think I was in the shoes of people trying to go to the United States. So uh, my experience might help a little bit. Uh, but definitely, uh, when I came, I, I played basketball, so I got a scholarship when I came to the United States. Um, but definitely moving to Houston, um, what what I was struggling with. I want to. I'm a, from, from small town in Poland right by watch uh so i was i was very big on having a place where it's not too crowded and too crazy because i like small spaces <laughs> uh so going to hbu where it was it's a fairly small campus and and it's a small school it's a private school so um so it was very very good family family oriented environment uh which kind of helped me going throughout the program uh, and, and Shannon, for example, she, she's like our mom for international students. She always knows, keeps us accountable. She always, always knows what we have to do. Uh, so we're not late. There's obviously a lot of things going on with international students as far as like the documents and, and paperwork and all kinds of craziness. Uh, but she's, she's always very, very helpful. Um, so we have that support, which is very, very important, especially for anyone coming from a different country. Uh, so I know like a lot of, a lot of kids that will be coming to the United States probably don't have uh, families here so um so i just love that the fact that we had that family and and some of us are back no matter what and and another thing is it's houston <laughs> so so i still had it's like a little blend so we have the small school and everything is super family oriented but you still get that the taste of united states and all the american dream in houston uh all the fun stuff uh so it's like it's a very cool blend um to experience when you come into a different country because definitely i was looking for uh, for for seeing that New York, that everything that every, everyone presents in the movies. So in Houston, we all obviously can get that. So definitely recommend Houston Baptist University. I think it was a very great experience. Thanks, Natalia. I appreciate it. Thank you. Just you. <laughs> all right. Thank you, Shannon. Thank you, Natalia. And last but not least, Chris, take us to the Midwest. All right, hi everybody. My name is Chris Dixon. I'm the Senior Assistant Director for Admissions at Wabash College for International Students. Um, Wabash College is a little unique in that we are one of three all-male schools in the U.S. Um, so all of our students are male, um, but of course we have, you know, lots of female and um, female faculty and staff. So you'll see women on campus, you just won't be taking classes with them. Um, this is a picture of, of Wabash. Um, everything you see underneath, you learn more, earn more, lead more, and play more, is part of Wabash College. Um, we recently just demolished this American football field and, and built a brand new stadium, which is really exciting for us. Um, all of these are the academic buildings. This is going to be our 7,000 square foot fitness facility. Everything is completely open to students. Um, we like to say, you know, it's, it's kind of like a, an all-inclusive resort once you're on campus. You have, you have one fee, everything is included. Um, including some of our immersion learning courses that I'll go over here in just a second. Um, so this is where Wabash College is. We're in Crawfordsville, Indiana. It's a city of about 16,000 people. Um, so it is a, it is a small city. Um, it's about three hours from Chicago. It's about an hour northwest of Indianapolis. So if you're looking for a bigger city experience, maybe go to the Indianapolis 500 racing event, or maybe go to an Indianapolis Colts game. Um, you can get there in about 45 minutes. When you're on campus, you feel like you're in that quintessential American campus. Um, we have our own Arboretum, where we have one example of, at least one example of, of every single indigenous tree in Indiana. Um, you know, you can be on campus and feel like you're in your own world. 
but then you can walk to the heart of Crawfordsville in about 10 minutes. We have about 900 students, so we are a small college. Um, and I say we're a college, we are only undergraduate institution. We have students from 26 states in about 19 or 20 different countries in any given year. Um, and every single year we're, we're a top 30 best value college. So one of the things we like to say at Wabash is you learn more, earn more, lead more, and play more. Our students don't just come to Wabash to sit in classrooms. Obviously that's a very big part of it. You're coming to a very academic institution, um, but our students also go on to you know, start clubs and organizations, and they go on to work in the community and that kind of thing. Um, so our students are very active every, in every aspect of their life. One of the things that we like to offer are immersion learning courses. Obviously, if you study at Wabash, you'd already be studying abroad, but we have immersion learning courses that are open to every single student. Some students do two or three of these at a time or in their four years with us. Um, but let's say you're studying the ancient Incan Empire um, in a history class or a Latin American class. You might actually go to Machu Picchu in Peru um, you know, at the end of the semester. And the best part about it is our immersion learning courses are completely paid for by our alumni network. All you need is a passport, which you already have, and you might want some fun money or some souvenir money and that kind of thing, but by and large, everything is paid for. We also have Wabash X programs. These aren't majors, but they're more than just a club on campus. So let's say you're interested in business, you can apply to be part of our CIBE program. And what that will be is you'll have guaranteed internships, you'll work with business leaders in the community and across the country to help solve real world business problems. Um, if you're into public health or want to study medicine, um, or even if you don't want to study medicine, let's say you're an artist. All of these Wabash X programs are open up to every single major on campus. Um, and some of them have travel aspects and some of them do not. Like a lot of the other schools, we have a list of majors and you can double major in these. So if you wanted to study mathematics and art, you could absolutely do that. If you wanted to do a major and a minor, you can do that too. Um, you know, the, the kind of the world is your oyster. You can mix and match a lot of these. Some of our most popular subjects include biology, biochemistry, chemistry, econ and financial econ, um, mathematics, physics, PPE. PPE is philosophy, politics, and economics all rolled into one major. According to the Princeton Review and, and Best Colleges Guide of 2020, we have the number one alumni network, number one internship opportunity, um, one of the best career services office, and our professors are always very, very accessible. Our average class size is 13 students per class, and we have a faculty to student ratio of 10 to one. So your professors are going to know you by name. They're going to know who you are, where you're from, what your goals are. Um, you know, they're going to remember the projects that you're doing in their classes, which comes into play when you're applying for jobs or graduate schools. Your professors will actually know, you know, lots about you and they'll be able to write a very detailed recommendation letter for you. Um, and not just, you know, a generic one where, you know, student X was in my class, he scored an A, he seemed to be very good. Like, he'll actually be able to personalize it for you or she. Um, some of the quick stats I'll, I'll run, I won't run into all of these, but we are um, the number nine happiest and most successful alumni, according to the Princeton Review. And within six months of graduation, 99.5% of our, our graduating class in 2019 um, had their first destination placement. So that's either a first job in their field of study or it is in a graduate school. During COVID, during the class of 2020, uh, when the world was shutting down because of the pandemic, we still had a 97.6% placement rating within six months. These are a few of our internships, fellowships, grad schools, and employment placings within the last five years. Um, I just got an update yesterday from our physics and philosophy majors. We also have students right now attending Oxford, Yale, Harvard, um, and Stanford for graduate school, um, earning their PhDs or their master's programs. We have over 70 clubs and organizations on campus, everything from Computer Science Club, Video Game Playing Club, um, Rugby Club. We have a Bass Fishing Club on campus. Um, if there's something on campus that you are interested in, we're going to have it for you. Um, if 
you want to start a new club, you can go to our student government, which is the 10th most active in the country. They control a few hundred thousand dollars each year for a campus of 900 students. Um, and you know, and you can you know be the president of your own of your own club and invite the rest of the campus on it. We have 10 national fraternities on campus and um, several dormitories. All of our students live on campus for all four years and housing is guaranteed for all four years. No student that goes to Wabash lives off campus. And that's what creates the alumni network and that strong brotherhood that you're going to have for the rest of your lives. All of our housing has been recently updated within the last 10 years or built new. This is an inside of one of our independent dorms. This is an example of the top row or three examples of our fraternity houses and the bottom row are three examples of our independent dorms. Um, Wabash is kind of unique in that every single student can um, rush to become part of a fraternity in the first semester of their freshman year. At a lot of schools, you need to be a sophomore. I'll skip ahead a little bit. We are Division Three athletics, so we are a very academic institution, but for the size of school and the division we're in, um, we have you know, several individual national championships and a lot of conference championships. Tons of traditions on campus. I'm starting to run out of time, but I'll skip ahead to scholarships, which is I'm sure everybody's on mind. Um, we have scholarships for international students that start at $30,000 per year and are renewable for up to four years. And we have need-based aid in the form of on-campus jobs where you could potentially earn up to $4,500 per year for um, personal expenses and that kind of thing. And last slide, only one school in the country made it to all of these lists. Um, of course, that is Wabash. So if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. But otherwise, I will look forward to speaking with you and the rest of the panel shortly. Okay, thank you, Chris. And now let's move on to some questions. Um, one of the questions that our participants asked through the registration form was about the international student admissions process and how it's been affected by COVID-19. Um, has the process changed at your institutions? And if so, how? Um, Lucy, would you like to start? Sure. Um, so at UMaine, um, I guess the most obvious thing that has changed is that we started accepting um, the dual lingo language test um, because it's more easily available online. So that's a new development from COVID and we're going to keep that even after COVID. Um, so that has been something that's changed on the admission side. Um, and then just our, um, the way we um, work with students um, has just become entirely online so um, 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 yeah so anything that was happening not online before is now happening online that's changed but the main thing is just that the um, the uh, English we broaden our English language testing opportunities um, and then we've also been more flexible on some deadlines because students have mm -hmm. had um, some some issues that are not their own fault because of COVID so okay Thank you. Shannon, what about Houston Baptist University? Um, what's the admission process like and has it been impacted by COVID related disruptions? Yes, it's actually been very beneficial for international students. I was actually pleasantly surprised. Um, so beforehand, um, we had to require an SAT or an ACT score for anyone to get a scholarship. But because of COVID, we have turned to test optional which means that you do not have to have an SAT or an ACT score. And this is beneficial for international students because I have seen our international students increase their scholarships um, because their grades are really a lot stronger than their SAT or their ACT scores. And we have been admitting them and giving them scholarships based heavily on their grades now. And so I have been really excited um, for our international students. So we, we actually have a benefit from COVID. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so um, what we really need from students is for you to show um, a strong essay in letters of recommendation, a high GPA, um, and strong like volunteer experience, things like that, because that really helps you get a high scholarship because you don't have an SAT or an ACT score to show. You do still have to have show English proficiency. And like Lucy said, we are accepting Duolingo, so that helps too. Um, the, the challenge that we have faced in the admissions process is 
um, embassy closures. And that's why it's really important for you to work with Education USA because they are so knowledgeable about what's going on with COVID and the embassies. And so really keep in touch with Education USA because they can tell you exactly what's going on as things are changing so quickly. Here, here. Tom, uh, please tell us about Suffolk's admissions process and if it's been affected in a similar fashion. Well, yes, in addition to what my colleagues have mentioned, I mean, everything is virtual. I mean, look at this fair, right? Um, we would normally spend a couple months every fall visiting schools, attending college fairs. Um, I handle countries in Europe and Africa. My colleagues cover Asia, the Middle East and the Americas, but we haven't been able to do any of that. Um, so we've been relying on fair platforms and some of them are better than others, but it's been a learning curve for everyone. And um, it's, you know, it's difficult to make connections with prospective students that way. Um, I think for as wonderful as technology is, um, we just feel it's not the same. And, um, you know, attendance wasn't as high at some of these um, virtual fairs as we would get at a traditional fair. And students are maxed out with screen time. And sometimes the last thing they want to do is spend more time on Zoom to speak to a college representative. and. I get that. So there have been some, you know, added challenges, but there are some advantages because I think, you know, with us being able to do this platform, we're reaching a lot more students this way as well. Okay, thank you. Now, speaking about the admissions process, um, how does an applicant stand out? Is there anything specific that your school is looking for in the application? Um, Monica, what should the applicate, uh, applicant focus on when applying to Fordham? Oh, I think uh, like most universities, you know, the first thing we're looking for is students who are, have the academic qualifications to be successful at our institutions. So we do look at students' academic backgrounds and we look a little deeper, I think, than uh, the process might be in, in some other countries because we go back for several years of students' education and uh, look at kind of patterns of education and strengths. Um, so I think that's one important criteria, absolutely, that, that we're looking for. Most U.S. universities are also looking beyond that as well. Um, so some schools will require testing, as we said. Certainly English language proficiency is absolutely required um, because we, again, want students to be successful in our classrooms. Uh, and I think, you know, we ask on the common application for the essay and the letter of recommendation and kind of what students do outside of the classroom because we're looking more holistically uh, at you know, what a student might bring to our campus. You know, I know at Fordham, we want students to bring their passions to campus. We want students, if you're you know, a wonderful violinist, we want you to come and play in our school orchestra. Uh, if you've done student government, we would love for you to come and be part of our student government and develop your leadership skills. Uh, if you're a great athlete, we want to bring you to campus for those reasons. Um, so students are all bringing different strengths outside of their academics, and that's definitely something that should be highlighted in the application. Uh, and I think particular to Fordham, you know, we're, we are a very urban university. So we are looking for students who are kind of ready to jump in to uh, in investigating, investigating and exploring all that New York City has to offer. Uh, somebody who really wants to, you know, jump on the subway and go visit new neighborhoods. Um, you know, we're great, you know, we're looking for a match there, not necessarily a student who's looking for a more kind of laid back or rural uh, location. And that will vary obviously from school to school kind of what the right match for students is. Thank you. Um, Chris, is there anything specific that Wabash College is looking for in the applications? Yeah, I mean, I would echo what Monica just said. Um, schools are, are looking for, you know, those, those unique students. Um, at Wabash, we are looking for, you know, people that have been proven leaders inside and outside of the classroom. We're, of course, looking at grades, but we want to see what people have been doing, you know, outside. Are they in athletics? Um, have they been you know, have they started their own volunteer organization in their community? Um, if they aren't volunteering or, or working at a, with an athletic team, are they working at a family of business? We want to get to know the student as an individual. Because like a lot of schools, we're reviewing applications very holistically. We want to get to know the student as an individual, not just as grades or test scores show. Um, those grades and test scores will, will be the foot in the door, but when we're looking at scholarships and we're looking at admission, we want to see the students that have gone above and beyond just the minimum. Okay, thank you for your admissions insights. Um, now let's talk about funding, as I can see that's the topic that has come up um, in the chat, chat box. 
So we've heard about the various types of funding available um, to international students at your institutions. Do you have any tips on how our students can boost their chances of getting financial aid at your institutions? Um, Shannon, would you like to start? Absolutely. Okay, so again, going back to the test optional because that is the hot topic right now. Um, so because we don't have SAT and ACT scores to rely on, you need really strong grades. And so if you're looking at what can I can do in the future to apply to the United States, please, please make sure that you have really high grades. That is the biggest thing that you can do. Study hard in school. The second thing is um, a lot of people don't understand that in the United States, it's really important to have leadership and volunteer experience. Um, so make sure that you're finding ways to volunteer. I know that um, COVID makes that really hard, but if there's ways that you can volunteer virtually um, or find leadership experience, um, talk to Education USA in Poland. I bet they have some um, ways that you can do that and some suggestions for how to do that specifically in Poland or talk to your high school counselor and see what they can um, suggest for ways that you can do that. Um, even during COVID. Um, so that would be a huge way um, to strengthen your application and increase your scholarship because that's what we're looking at. Letters, strong letters of recommendation. You want somebody who knows you well. So even if you know somebody who's really important, but they don't know you well, that's not going to be as good of a letter of recommendation as a teacher who knows you well and can speak to your characteristics. Um, also, um, if you write a strong essay, so make sure that that essay talks about you personally um, and really talks about your situation. If you have a situation that you really need to explain to us, for example, I was working with a student the other day who has sickle cell anemia. Um, and so she needed to include that in her application so that we can include that in our admissions decision and understand like why her grades one year weren't as strong as they were another year. Um, so that's really important to make sure that we can understand that when we're making an admissions decision. Um, there's also extra scholarships available. Um, so make sure that you're looking at the extra scholarships. For example, we have a church matching grant. So if like you have a scholarship from a church, we will match that. Um, we have fine arts scholarships in addition to our regular merit scholarships. So please um, make sure that you meet with your college advisor one-on-one -on -one to talk about your specific situation. We would love to set up a Zoom call with you. I'm sure any of us would love to do that and meet with you one-on-one -on -one to discuss your specific situation. That's the best thing that you can do. Thank you. Um, Lucy, any tips for students planning to apply for financial aid at the University of Maine? Yeah, well, very similar to what Shannon said. So I'll just add a few, a few other things to consider um, the the usually the easiest scholarships to find are the ones that are part of the admissions process so coming from the admissions office so those you usually you'll see them as you're applying um, or you'll see them on the admissions website but just to echo Shannon's comments the um, there are often scholarships from different departments so I encourage you to ask the your an admissions counselor where you're applying if there are any um, scholarships available in your department. Those usually require a separate application and you kind of need to sort through them yourself. So that's always a good question to ask. And then the other thing, um, at, at many US universities, you can request a reconsideration of your scholarship. Um, so if you, if you are really interested in a school, but you just, um, the scholarship is, is just, um, not meeting um, what you can, what your budget is, you can request a reconsideration and the answer might be no. So you have to be aware of that, but it's, it doesn't hurt to ask. And I encourage you, if you are gonna ask, um, to think about, if you just say, can you just give me a full, a completely full, full tuition scholarship or a full waiver, then the answer is probably gonna be no. But if you can think about it in a way that, okay, my family has this much for, you know, in our budget, we need, this amount to cover the gap you know you kind of think in more reasonable terms if you just straight ask for a full tuition scholarship it's probably not going to be a positive answer but you can ask for a reconsideration and just um, think about how it really fits into your budget okay thank you um chris what about um applying for funding at wabash any special insights for our students yeah i would say well i guess first and foremost if you're an admitted student at wabash you're guaranteed scholarships 
Uh, and like I said before, our, our scholarships start at $30,000 per student um, for four years. If you want additional scholarships beyond that, because if you're admitted, we already think you're going to be successful and we would love to have you on campus. Um, but if you're looking for our trustee scholarship, which pays you know, full tuition, room and board for all four years, that kind of thing, we're looking for students to be very genuine in their essays. Um, we want to see what an individual is like. We want to see um, the ups and downs of their life. We want to see you know, everything about them. We'll even schedule Zoom meetings with them. With reading hundreds of applications each semester, we can kind of see you know, the same standard copy and paste essays every single time. Um, but if you are one of those that will really stand out and show us who you are as a person, that'll increase your scholarships with us. Okay, thank you. Um, we have time for one more question, um, perhaps this one. Uh, how does your institution foster a diverse and inclusive campus culture? Tom, would you like to comment on this one? Sure. Um, you know, I think diversity inclusion um, and for Suffolk are actually part of our mission statement. So there's definitely a top down philosophy there are resources available and we have a vice president of diversity access and inclusion um, she ensures that we're doing what we can to promote a diverse student body as well as faculty and staff um, i think a lot of it just starts with listening um, it allows us to assess and improve a student's experience and as i mentioned during my presentation you know we have multiple affinity groups that foster pride on um, the sense of belonging um, we perform outreach to connect with communities that are underserved by higher education and create inclusive hiring and retention practices to really build a community that represent that reflects the world right um, i think we need to keep in mind that diversity is a continuous process um, it's not a goal to be reached but a way of living and learning and when the broadest possible range of people contribute their voices abilities, ideas, that's when the entire community thrives. Thank you. Um, Monica, what about Fordham? How is the message of um, uh, the message and culture of inclusion um, promoted at your institution? Well, I think it's, it's such a timely question, right? I mean, anyone following news yes. in the United States in the last year has absolutely heard about the, the struggles, the strain, the pain that a lot of people in the US are going through, kind of trying to wrestle with issues of diversity and inclusion. And uh, universities are absolutely part of the kind of response or part of the um, going through the going through those processes. I think most of our institutions, you know, have, have been more reflective recently. And uh, you know, Fordham is probably in line with a lot of other schools in you know, taking a hard look at what type of institutional racism might exist and how we can kind of eradicate that, how we can better support our current students and how we can really welcome new students in a way that makes them feel like they're absolutely part of the community and, and a very important um, necessary part of the community. So, you know, similar to Suffolk, you know, we have a vice president for diversity, equity and inclusion who's been working with all sorts of different campus groups. Uh, there has been, you know, some, there have been some, you know, uh, very articulate anti-racism statements at the university, anti-racism training that's being integrated for staff, faculty, and students uh, over the next kind of, I imagine, few years. Um, as Tom said, it's a process, and uh, I don't know that we're ever going get, to get to the end, but we kind of continue to work to improve and uh, listen, and absolutely listen to the people in our community whose voices are critical, and I think that's uh, the most important thing that, that we can do right now, listen and respond um, to, the, to the voices that we've been hearing more loudly. And uh, I think we really need to honor those voices and respond appropriately. And I think that, um, you know, it's an ongoing struggle and hopefully we kind of move to a better space um, over time. But uh, I think, you know, Fordham and I'm sure all of the institutions kind of on this call, you know, are committed to, to those um, to, to those improvements that we can try to make. Thank you, Monica. I think those words provide a perfect wrap up for this discussion. Um, Monica, Lucy, Tom, Shannon, and Chris, thank you so much for dedicating your time to be with us today and sharing your insights and tips. 
Um, if there are further questions from the participants, please remember you can contact the schools directly using the contact information on our landing page. And now we will move on um, to the second panel.